Okay, so we're assuming we have a collapsing operation, which we'll get to how to do that, the definition, that relates a G of alpha to an F of the collapsed version of alpha. And so let me show you something really cool about that. So it, in, in itself, it's a good thing to have that relates sort of sh the, the real thing, the Fs and the shadows, G, and you can do it multiple times. Okay, so suppose, though, we were able to find, oops, a little too far, okay, an infinite sequence, let's call it tau of n of ordinals, and I'm using those brackets advisedly because it's going to be essentially we're going to use it as a fundamental sequence for a slightly bigger ordinal. Um, we have a suppose we had an infinite sequence of ordinals that formed a chain related by the collapse operation, so that the collapse of the n plus first thing in the sequence they're they're getting bigger as n gets bigger. The collapse of the n plus first tau is exactly just the previous tau, the nth tau. Suppose we could do that. We don't even know what the collapsing operation is yet, but suppose we had one that had this relation between f and g, and suppose we had one of these sequences. So then what would we have? We'd have g, the g function, the slow-growing function, evaluated at the slightly bigger tau ordinal, tau of n plus 1, would be the f function at the collapsed version of that, which, of course, would be the f at the previous tau. So we would have a g appearing in one place in the sequence with a certain kind of ordinal indexing it, is exactly equal to f of the previous one. Okay, so why is that so useful? Well, now let ta be the soup of all those guys. Let it be the limit of all those guys as an ordinal. Really, we're going to do it as a slightly different kind of thing, but essentially just let's, let's think of it as the usual idea of whenever you have a sequence of ordinals, that's all an increasing sequence of ordinals. You can always think about the ordinal at those limit too. Okay, so in particular, as I said, the tau of n are exactly just a fundamental sequence for this master new ordinal tau, okay? And we're going to use that to define g's and f's as applied to tau, as we always do, okay? So then what happened, what do we know about g sub tau, let's say, of n plus 1, okay? By definition, you use the n plus first element of the sequence, the fundamental sequence for tau, plug that into the index for g, evaluate it at n plus 1, we've done that many times now, Okay, uh, so but that is equal to f of the previous tau, uh, with that as the ordinal index, evaluated at n plus 1. Hey, that is greater than f sub tau of n of n, just because f is an increasing function, and that is exactly what you would get if you took tau itself again, one more time, use the f sub tau function and plugged in n, and notice what we've got we've got the g sub tau of one bigger numerical index, n plus 1, is bigger than f sub tau of n. And that is the answer to our first question. We, that, this gives us a recipe for finding a magic ordinal tau such that g catches up with f. If we can find this collapsing operation that has this nice relationship between, relationship between f and g and a sequence tau that's sort of a, a collapsing chain. And that's that is actually going to be pretty easy once we once we set up all the other machinery. Okay. Now, this this tau is going to be a very big ordinal. Okay. It's the limit of this sequence of tau of n's, and each time you ratchet up the n, each of them turns a g function into an f function. Okay. We know that that's an incredibly huge increase. So that that if you have this kind of relationship that g of a certain ordinal is the same function as f of the previous ordinal in the sequence, this new ordinal in the sequence we know has to be unbelievably bigger. Um, and so the limit of that is going to be even bigger. Okay. So both g and g sub tau, of course, and f sub tau, which we now know are very, very comparably fast growing, they will be unbelievably fast growing functions. Okay. Um, at the same time, as soon as exactly when we get to tau, we lose our this wonderful crutch by sort of we thrown it away on purpose. The idea that g could be a useful pale shadow of f because it's not. It's really a, it's not the same function, but it grows. Oops, let's see. That's going to be f sub tau. It grows at essentially the same growth rate. Um, and so we've as as is so often with this kind of stuff, you drive every idea to extinction. You drive it so far that it becomes useless. Um, and then you pick up a new idea. Okay, so for example, f sub, um, so and why not do our, our one of our favorite tricks, once you've got sort of some sort of limit ordinal, like tau, um, don't just put 
that into the argument for f. Let's put that plus 1. And I'm going to put my traditional argument of 3 in here. So this is, this is, this is, I haven't just defined the details here, but this is going to be the biggest number that I've ever created in this series by far uh, at this point. F sub tau plus 1 of 3, um, you, of course, you take, you just iterate F tau three times. So you get F tau of 3. So that's, we're going to find that the third ordinal in this tau sequence, and that's going to be already bigger than bh, quite a bit bigger than bh, something that needs multiple stages of ordinal collapsing functions basically to recreate. You're going to use that, you're going to put that, evaluate that at 3. <coughs> and then of course, you're going to put that in into the tau sequence argument. You're going to say, ooh, let's build this sequence of huger and huger ordinals, each one of which, even, <coughs> excuse me, tau 1, tau 2, tau 3, are already huge ordinals. We're going to take th this one, <laughs> And we're going to use f of that, and we're going to apply that to this huge function, and then we'll do it one more time, just to be ridiculous. Okay, that is absolutely staggeringly larger than fbh of three, which is what's kind of our previous record holder. Okay, so that's what's gonna. Once we get it all sorted out, we're going to have a precise definition of what this thing would be, um, and it's going to be utterly ridiculous. Now, notice that as soon as we actually get finite taws we still, in principle, have access to our, um, our crutch, that f tau of 3 of 3, if we want to just look at that guy and said, in isolation, how many um, steps would it be to do the initial expansion of that? That would be g sub tau of 3 of 3, and that's f sub tau of 2. So we could almost use that crutch. But once we start using this over and over again, we've kind of just thrown away the ability to do that. But it's worth it. It's a, big, it's a bigger number. Um, okay, don't need caps lock. Okay, um, so we need to create this capsuling op collapsing operation, C, and the sequence tau of n, and we're actually going to recreate a lot of stuff uh, from scratch almost to do that, and I'm, I'm going to not just trot out the explicit definitions right away, I'm going to kind of lead us into that and motivate that. So the key for, for me, after reading this article over and over and over again, um, is we're really using the idea behind the fast-growing hierarchy. Um, and essentially, without modification, it's a, the most direct and massive generalization of the fast-growing hierarchy idea that we've had so far. And we're going to use that to create bigger and bigger ordinals. Um, this is due to, to Wehner. Um, after all, the, 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 even the minimal extension that we've been using over a long time of the fast-growing hierarchy is due partly to him anyway. Um, and so this is, it's natural that he would take this idea further. So I've already talked about, when, when I first introduced Veblen, I kind of motivated that by saying, hey, it's, it's similar to like what the fast-growing hierarchy looks like, similar ideas of iteration, recursion, diagonalization. Um, OCFs had a similar flavor, and I was talking about how they cre in, integrate the arithmetic of uncountable ordinals as well. Um, but it turns out, and this is a little bit of a surprise to me reading this article, is that we can actually really just emulate the fast-growing hierarchy even more closely than both those ideas. And it, in some ways, it works better, at least for this particular purpose. Okay, um, We are, it is going to use uncountable ordinals, and it's going to have a certain collapsing property in itself. Um, and so we're going to use uncountable ordinals to create countable ordinal. So it is really a species of ordinal collapsing function as well. And um, it's uh, it's closely related to, I think, what was the absolute original ordinal collapsing function, I believe, due to Bachmann. And it's going to be based on Bachmann's ideas. Uh, I certainly don't know the details, and I don't have uh, great access to the literature. Um, so I could be wrong about some of the uh, attributions. OK. Um, so a little bit more about the setup. One thing that's going to happen is that specific fundamental sequences are going to be crucially, crucially important. If, when, we've, when we've been doing this so far, we've had this idea that ordinals are just good old-fashioned ordinary ordinals. They don't have to come with fundamental sequences to exist. But then as soon as we put them, we, we try to use them to create fast-growing functions, we actually do have to attach to them a specific choice of fundamental sequence. Um, but you know what? That's all we've ever used ordinals for in this, this, these videos anyway. 
And so it's, it's a little silly to think of the fundamental sequences as side data. And what we're going to do is we're going to recast the theory. We're going to actually create what's called tree ordinals. And basically, and again, this is originally due to Bachman, I believe, um, they're basically just ordinals with fundamental sequences consistently attached to them and whatever is used to create them and what is ever used to create them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So very, for roughly, um, we'll come back to a more precise idea. And the precise idea is very elegant, but I don't want to make it it's a little abstract. Roughly what we have is that we've got a hierarchy of different um, tree ordinals. And you can just, you can really kind of think, of, they're often called number classes, just more and more complicated kinds of numbers. Um, omega zero. So again, the big omega here is not what I was using omega for uh, before. This is, I'm using the notation from Wainer's article, slow versus fast growing. So this is not a particular ordinal. It is a set of tree ordinals. So big omega zero is just the natural numbers, straight up. No, no, nothing really different. Omega one includes those guys and includes basically all countable ordinals including our friend omega. We're going to actually decorate that specifically as omega naught or omega sub zero, uh, which is going to have a slightly different meaning from omega. It's basically omega with the absolute standard choice of fundamental sequence, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, et cetera, attached to it. Omega two is going to be all those guys, uh, finite natural numbers plus countable ordinals, plus uh, certain uncountable ordinals, including little omega one, which has its usual meaning when you see this notation. It's basically the ordinal version of, um, uh, it's the least uncountable ordinal. Um, it's the smallest uncountable ordinal. So it's just the smallest thing that, that doesn't belong in big omega one. Um, and then big omega three is gonna be all that stuff, plus some bigger uncountable ordinals, things that are um, bigger in terms of cardinality than the stuff in omega two including uh, little omega-2, which is the next biggest ordinal in terms of cardinality. Okay, so you're going to, it helps if you have familiarity with the basics of what ordinal versus cardinal means and what is what does cardinality mean. But honestly, it's not actually technically necessary um, to really focus on countable versus uncountable cardinality, that kind of stuff. Just like with the OCFs, it wasn't actually the most important thing. Um, you just, you want you want to recognize that things in omega-2 the new things in omega-2 are qualitatively bigger than things in big omega-1, and similarly, things in big omega-3 are qualitatively bigger than things in big omega-2. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, so here I explain. omega naught is basically just a mutual omega. Omega-1 is the least uncountable ordinal. Uh, that is something we were calling big omega before. Sorry for the notational shift, but I wanted to be agree with the article. And then little omega-2 is the least ordinal with cardinality greater than that of omega-1. Okay. Um, so. So this is this is the new world we're going to be in. Um, it's basically these kinds of gadgets, but with the very important proviso that any time we talk about an ordinal, it's going to have a fundamental sequence intrinsically as part of the data, not as extra side data. Um, and we'll we'll discover a nice way to do that from the, from scratch um, in the basic definition. But um, but that's how we want to think about it. Okay, so that's going to be our, our world we're going to live in, and we're going to recreate the fast-growing hierarchy. Um, we're going to recreate the slow-growing hierarchy and show see how they relate. That's going to create this, this collapse function C and our sequence Ta, and that's what we want to do.